This is Talking Netflix. I'm your host, Rascal F. Kennedy. And I'm James Preston Poole, lead critic for Full Circle Cinema. And I'm Mark Tan, the managing critic for Full Circle Cinema. Today, we are going to discuss what could lead up to the greatest trilogy on Netflix. Today, we are going to discuss The Kissing Booth. We are going to actually do a double feature and talk about the first one and the second one. I don't know if you guys have watched it. If you haven't watched it, I would stay far away from this podcast because I'm sure we're going to spill and spoil and we're going to go in, out, and around this whole entire series so far. So if you haven't watched The Kissing Booth, The Kissing Booth is about our main character, Elle, played by Joey King, and her best friend, Lee Flynn. They've been best friends since they were born, basically. And they have to come up with, not a project. Somebody help me here. It's like a fundraiser, I think. It's a fundraiser for their carnival that they have in their county every year. So they come up with a kissing booth. And with this kissing booth comes what seems like true love. So it's very, very interesting. James, what are your thoughts? For years, not only just from different people in my life, but from people in Full Circle, I've been hearing forever about how The Kissing Booth was one of the best bad movies of all time. And I didn't believe the hype, but as soon as I sat down about a week ago to watch this movie, I can say from start to finish, my jaw hung open, my eyes were wide, And I was laughing at just about every moment in this movie. Look, it might not be a good movie, but The Kissing Booth is cinema. Period. (laughs) Mark? Fun fact. I actually watched The Kissing Booth when it came out a couple years ago. And when I first saw it, it wasn't one of those movies where I got much from it other than it was just another teen movie that just happens to be on Netflix because Netflix does a lot of teen movies now. And like James, I have been seeing these certain takes about the movie, how wildly bad it is. So realizing that there was going to be a second movie, I decided to rewatch it in preparation for the second one. And I have to agree, it's definitely a goofy, kind of terrible And it's not the kind of film that sparks much imagination, especially if you want to go beat by beat. It feels very much like most other low-grade teen comedies of the past couple years. But every so often, there's always this tiny character moment or reaction from a certain actor that really made me laugh, even though it really shouldn't because the actual humor, it's pretty cringy. But in terms of unintentional humor, it's, it's pretty up there. I will say that had it not been for this podcast, I never, ever would have laid my eyes on this movie. (laughs) But actually, as far as a romantic comedy goes, this movie, it follows the formula to a T. I personally think that 90% of the writing in this movie is cringy. Like Mark said, it does have its moments. And it does also have its moments where you laugh and you laugh a lot. Because you kind of have secondhand embarrassment for a lot of the characters in this film, especially Ellen Lee. And at first, whenever I first started watching it, I was like, this is extremely corny. And then I went back into our group chat and I was like, oh, I'm lying. This is hilarious. For an hour and 45 minutes, I just sat there and laughed because the movie is predictable. If you haven't seen this film, you are going to be able to pretty much on a whim say exactly what's going to happen as the film goes. But other than that, it's quality cinema on Netflix. Definitely. It's definitely quality enough to warrant a sequel. If, if we're going to drop the bit for just one second, if there's one thing that is genuinely kind of good about these movies, I would say it's that Joey King is pretty fantastic. She has great comic timing and she could carry a legitimately good movie, but I'm glad she used her talents for this beautiful train wreck. Yeah, most definitely. One of the things that, even on the first viewing, where I was pretty much nonplussed about the movie, yeah, the one thing that did stand out was King's performance and how how well she was able to commit to the goofy parts of her character, especially because this is a plot in which one of the, the focal points of the relationship between Elle and Lee is that they basically have to follow this guidebook on like how to be friends to each other. And the fact that this whole plot centers around the whole idea about 
this rule book was created when they were kids, and then they're still carrying those same rules when they're teenagers. In concept, that's pretty ridiculous, and yet somehow with King and just how she reacts to everything, it it's the one thing in this whole wild movie where I was able to actually buy what was happening. Yeah, I can agree with that. Very odd set of rules. One rule would be like, okay, well, no sharing sandwiches. And the next rule will be like, if you date my brother, you're dead to me. Like, it's it's zero to 1,000 <laughs> rule to rule. You know what's crazy? The whole rule book, that rule right there specifically, which we're kind of giving away the movie a little bit, but oh well. That rule specifically about dating the brother, I really thought this was going to go left and she was going to end up with Flynn. Can we motion that to the spoiler section? But yeah. (laughs) It's weird how the only person that Elle has chemistry with is the character that she shows no romantic interest in, and he shows no romantic interest in her. Because I think we can all agree that Lee and Elle would have made for a much better couple than Lee and the creep she ends up with. I can agree with that. Even even just from the first scene we see of Noah, he's he struck me as just a guy with no strong personality up until a certain point we find out where he's basically a personality that he has is creep. That's the only thing that I was able to really grasp from the movie. The whole movie feels like Elle and Lee are going to be that kind of couple that start out as friends but then realize oh we're actually into each other. But because of reasons, the movie just doesn't go in that direction. The reasons are stupid. It's like they try to do this plot twist thing, but it's not really a plot twist. And it's annoying because instead of trying to make it a plot twist, you should have just given us what we wanted originally, which was for L and Lee to be together, not L and creepy guy. Listen, when it comes to the plot of the movie, I didn't see L falling in love with Noah. I saw Noah harassing the hell out of L until she just eventually decided, okay, I guess I'll date you. Despite the narration, which, okay, first of all, let, let's let's talk about the first five minutes first. The movie starts off, and they give us about five movies worth of information. It's like, this person's my best friend. I've been in love with Noah. Oh, by the way, my mom had a serious illness and died. Oh, and I love Dance Dance Revolution for some reason. As soon as that opening hit, I was like, okay, buckle up. We're in for a ride. It doesn't help that that opening sequence is, it's an opportunity for the director to just speed through so much material, not just in terms of the narration, but also even the filmmaking. Uh, One way in which we see Elle and Lee age is what the director does is he basically just rotates around the two of them playing the DDR clone, by the way, it's not actually DDR, but whatever, copyright. It just keeps cutting and just spinning around, spinning around, just because? That was just something I just never cut at all. Well, I mean, clearly, um, what's the name of this uh, filmmaker who made this movie? Oh, Vince Marcello is clearly an auteur and is trying to make his, uh, his mark on the genre. So, Mark, I think you're just missing out on a uh, on a key stylistic choice he was making to set himself apart. You know what? You convinced me. I think he's a genius and no other director's better than him. Oh, yeah. I also thought it was really interesting how the script was written in a way where despite being a romantic comedy with a um, woman in the lead, you can tell that a woman came nowhere near the script because, okay, let's get back to it. Noah is a creep. Man, you know what? He was the definition of a weirdo. Any guy who talked to L and he's like up in arms, ready to box. Oh, you're like a little sister to me. Nah, bro, you're a creeper. That's what that is. Exactly. I just, whenever it boiled down to the end of the movie, it's like this great buildup and it's all, you know, cheesy and romantic, but it's just like, bro, Noah has issues. It's like, so Noah has these anger issues that they never address. And it's just, it's crazy. It's just nutty to watch, man. In fact, um, there's one particular moment with him that is one of the moments that is pretty much infamous in our group where it's it's a beach scene in which one of the other guys there, he starts talking to Elle and he basically invites her just so he can just play around with her. And Elle's clearly 
uncomfortable with the situation. So what happens? Noah comes in, he he yells at him, and he's about to start attacking him, but then L kind of calms him down, and they slowly walk away, and the other guy makes another remark, your little brother sloppy seconds, and then that leads to Noah just beating the other guy up, and it just happens out of nowhere. <laughs> so, looking at the credits to this movie, and directed by a man, and the book is written by a woman... So I wonder what the differences are. Like, I actually want to read the book now. I'm kind of intrigued because James brought it up. Like, I want to know, I want to see the differences between the film and the actual book. Noah not being so bad on the page, but in the movie, he's like kind of, you know how um, it's kind of like, there's that saying, like, if he like makes fun of you or treats you badly, he likes you. That's what Noah is. And that's what Noah represents as a character. He's not kind towards L. He's not charming. He's really has no personality outside of being this controlling like creep. And even look at the central the, like the title moment in the movie, the kissing booth. The only reason they get together is cuz he tricks L into being blindfolded so he can go up and kiss her. Did he not know A about the rules that her and her lifelong best friend, his brother, had set in stone. And B, did he not realize it was a little creepy to just go up and kiss this girl without her knowing uh, while he's been rude to her the entire movie? I don't know. Like, whenever I see stuff like that happen, I just immediately think, dumb teenager stuff. That's the only way I can really explain something like that. Especially, yeah, you're right. Noah, because... Leonore brothers, do you think that Noah would at least be told of some of these rules? But he clearly doesn't care. I'm sure he knew about those rules. A hundred percent sure, because he brings them up constantly. So it's known that he knows what those rules are. He just doesn't care. He doesn't have any regard or any respect for his little brother. And that also disturbs me. You know, I I'm surprised he even knew the rules because... The dudes were only in, like, two or three scenes together. Why do we do this? We're just riffing on this movie and riffing on how bad Noah is. But this still is a very entertaining, hilarious movie. Like, every moment is just kind of off and weird. So I feel like the only way we can properly talk about the kissing booth is by going around and sharing our favorite moments. We've touched on mine. Any scene involving Noah and Tuppen, those are the best scenes right there. Whenever Tuppen stands L up, that's because, well, no, you know what? That was Lee, actually, that where Lee takes her to go play the games because Tuppen stands her up on accident. And, but you know what? Now that I think about it, L kind of did the same thing. She was kind of antagonizing Noah once she saw him act that way once. She kind of did things to almost ensure that he would react the same way constantly with that vicious anger that he had pent up for whatever reason. I was trying to just think through my favorite scenes. I think I have my favorite scene. It's with L and Noah. It's a nighttime scene where they're trying to basically get shelter because it's raining outside. So Noah takes L to this, it's like a small like location basically. And it's basically where they confess each other's love. And it's at that scene where Noah basically says, I've never taken another girl to this place. This is like this. I'm taking you to this place because I, I really, really like you. So they confess their love. They make out. And out of nowhere, the security guy, this location says, hey, what are you doing here? Isn't this like the 10th girl you brought over here? To which Elle just looks at him and just starts flipping out at him <laughs> like could, could that guy have blown up his spot anymore like well, he might as well have come in and been like hey there noah is this where you brought that other girl five minutes ago <laughs> it was rough it was so rough i completely agree with you mark that scene was gold and plus, why do you even have to say, like, you're the first girl i've taken here like you know that's just a bomb that's gonna go off at some point it's just some cheesy line just to make Elle fall in love with him even more, I guess. I mean, it's just a, a canned line. <laughs> I've never understood that. There's no need to lie. If you actually just tell the truth, you'll get further in life. But that's just me. 
I would have to say my favorite scene, embrace yourself, because I'm about to about to break this one down, the party scene. Oh, brother. Explain. So, like, a third of the way through the movie, right, they go to this, like, nice, like, luxurious party, right? Which, first of all, how are we supposed to relate to these characters when these parents are all billionaires? They go to this eyes wide shut style mansion there's got to be at least like five million berries somewhere in the grass right like it is nice so there's problem number one and l is offered to drink and she's like i've never drinking before cut to a montage of her having an amount of drinks that would utterly kill anybody who had never drank it before right and then suddenly Vince Marcello, he, go, he goes a little ambitious. It turns into something like Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, where it appears that the alcohol that Elle drank is giving her hallucinogenic effects because the filmmaking just goes wild. And what's supposed to be a fun teenage party, at least what they tell us in the movie, turns into something that I found just like hilariously scary and horrifying. And then she just blacks out and wakes up, and Noah's like, way there. Yeah, I think she wakes up in his clothes, right? Yeah, in his in his clothes after this nightmarish experience. That was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen in a movie. And I hope that nobody, and I do mean nobody, ever tries to reiterate that in real life. No, absolutely, absolutely not. Like... It reminded me of the movie Climax, only maybe maybe a little more scary. Climax is less scary than that scene. Oh, like that was so strange because one, I guess nobody really cared because it was Noah. Because I'm sure everybody saw him take her off the table, and nobody says anything because oh, it's just Noah. But dude, why wouldn't you say something or go get Lee? It was so odd and uncomfortable, and they never addressed it again in the movie. It's just, oh, haha, I woke up in Noah's clothes. It's like, no, this is not cool. Yeah, especially if you consider if something like this were to happen, you know that there's something that happened in between Noah grabbing Elle because she's drunk and then her waking up. You know that something you probably shouldn't mention. It's really bad. It just don't do it. Yeah, and I think that all goes back to the fact that like the, the filmmakers behind this movie are really oblivious in how romance works, in how teenagers work, and just kind of like the, the implications they make with these characters and these situations. Because like this isn't the only moment in the movie like this. Like It's up until the end where, of course, Elle ends up with Noah. The movie is just gleefully, like, not self-aware of what it is. And that's kind of the reason it's such a fun watch is because it's just, as I said earlier, it's a beautiful train wreck. It is very, very entertaining. That's really all I can give it. it. It's just a very entertaining movie. This movie has six stars on IMDb. So what do you guys rate this movie on a scale of one to ten if we're talking legitimate quality two out of ten uh the filmmaking is there i guess and joey king is great but it's just so misguided in nearly every moment there's not one moment that genuinely lands but in terms of how much i enjoyed watching the movie oh it's a 10 for sure so i guess the average of that would be six so I guess that's where they get it on IMDb. For me, in terms of storytelling and filmmaking, I'd probably give it about a three because it just doesn't satisfy in any way. Most of the comedy elements are pretty weak. In fact, it even has a joke that just centers around a group of, how do I say this, uh, mean girls, in which their initials are literally OMG. But, again, in terms of enjoyment, I would probably give it about a 6. I did enjoy parts of it, but it was mostly because it was unintentionally funny. So I guess if you want to average that out, I would give it a 4, maybe 4.5. Give it a 6. I think whenever I came into the group chat after I watched it, I think, yeah, I said about a 5 or a 6. The more we've talked about this movie, 
the value's gone down. The replay value for this movie is not there. This is something that I don't ever have to watch again. It's just one of those things where I saw it, that's fine. And I don't ever have to watch it again unless my girlfriend wants to watch it. But other than that, it's got a horrible replay value. The writing is meh. I hate to be that guy, but yeah, it's about a five or a six. So I guess we all averaged out to about a six, right? Yeah, I gave it out a four. So that probably, I think between your sixes and my four, probably leads to maybe a five, 5.3. We talked about it. Um, the kind of less I enjoy it because, you know, Noah, Noah is a creep and that's all well and good, but... I didn't realize how much of a creep he was until we all pooled our answers together. Yeah, I mean, for me, him being creep, it really showed in the second viewing, but I think the movie cuts in between him being creep and then other goofy moments just enough. This movie hasn't really gone down in my estimation, but it's not it's been pretty much plateauing around where, where I'm at right now. Uh, although, if there is something that makes me want to bring it down is just thinking about how our boy Vince Marcello thought, huh, who should we get to play the mother of the Flynn brothers? Oh, let's get this icon of the 80s, Molly Ringwald, just for a couple minutes, just because she's a name. And it just feels very cynical. And yeah, if there's anything that might bring my opinion down, it's that. It's like they thought, you know what, we're, we're taking the icon from these these movies everyone loves, and we're passing the torch to this new generation. And you know what? I think they're right, because the second film in this saga, The Kissing Booth 2, might be even better than the first. I think The Kissing Booth 2 was actually, unironically, a pretty solid rom-com, and I actually really liked most of it. It still has a lot of the same issues as the first movie, but I can at least say Noah is far less creepy, so it makes it a much more comfortable experience. So since we are on to The Kissing Booth 2, I will go ahead and read our synopsis. In the sequel to 2018's The Kissing Booth, high school senior L juggles a long-distance relationship with her dreamy boyfriend Noah, college applications, and a new friendship with a handsome classmate that could change everything. This movie also has like an extra 30 minutes added to it from the original. The original was an hour and 45 minutes. Part two is two hours and 14 minutes. So I guess 29 minutes instead of 30. It was absolutely necessary. I mean, the first Kissing Booth, consider it like an entry into this universe. We're getting introduced to these characters. They're sort of giving us the lore. And this movie is like a Shakespearean epic with all sorts of converging characters and plot lines. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, Mark, Rascal, what, what did you think of this cinematic masterpiece? It's a cinematic masterpiece. You, you already said it. <laughs> um, it's funny you mentioned that the movie is... 29 minutes longer than the original because while it has m more screen time to it and there are more subplots going on in terms of the actual execution of it i would say this is exactly on the same level as the first one in terms of especially in terms of the broadness of the comedy this one might actually be more so even if you're talking about certain scenes of it this does improve a little bit on the first one in the fact that there's less noah He's not a, much of a creep this time around. However, in place of Noah, we have a new character who's maybe not as creepy as him, but I, I feel like he's pretty sus, is the character of Marco. MVP. <laughs> MVP. I like Marco. <laughs> I think he's okay. And obviously, like he's not a creep like Noah. It's just, I don't know, just something about him seemed off i think maybe that's intentional because he's literally introduced with him through a, a workout video where it's this professionally lit professionally edited video of him working out i see close-ups of his muscles and as rascal alluded he's the mvp he's the mvp for several reasons but overall it's messier and it's somehow a little bit less annoying than the, the first one what i will say is Marco, he's definitely not as creepy as Noah. 
I would definitely rather Marco in both of these movies, even though he's not in the first one, than the character that is Noah. He seems like a genuine, regular rom-com character. Like he's trying to genuinely woo the girl and win her over, whereas Noah just went at it in a very aggressive, creepy manner. So my personal thoughts on the overall movie, though, are that this was way better than the first one. There was more substance, and I actually felt like I was a part of the characters, maybe because of the first one, but also because there was a lot more character development in this one versus the first movie. You see, I I joke around when I say things like the first movie was, you know, setting up the lore. But, you know, in a way, I I feel like they actually did use these characters to kind of say some interesting, often problematic things about relationships. You know, as we start off this movie, Elle is debating whether or not she should go to colleges near where Noah lives. But beyond that, she's also, you know, suspicious of Noah, who, while less creepy this time, is definitely acting sus. And then on top of that, Lee's girlfriend is upset because Elle is getting a little clingy to Lee. So so we have a lot to cook with here. And then you throw in Marco, who Elle has a legitimate connection with, You know, I'm not going to say that the script by Vince Marcello and Jay Arnold is a neat script, but at the very least, it had a lot happening, and most of it I was pretty interested in. Yeah, I have to agree with you on that, because there is more character development this time with Elle, particularly how the film actually deals with her kind of being a terrible friend to Lee, especially considering how much she hangs around Lee and his girlfriend. It felt like this is the first time in this saga, we should call it, where it feels like the characters are actually interesting. And there is more going on on a plot level. I'm not going to go so far as to say that it's clever or original, but it is interesting and I wouldn't have expected it, particularly in the case of when Elle and Lee, when they're at the arcade and Elle sees that she needs to raise more money. Instead of doing another kissing booth, she finds out there's this dance, dance clone competition that's going on. And we brought up MVP earlier. Turns out the MVP in question is Marco. So the film takes a dive into her and Marco being this dance, dance competition pair. And even though the actual resolution of that's pretty predictable, just The fact that this movie stops just so it could indulge in the competition, it's it was definitely something that surprised me. And I commented earlier about the overzealous directing of our boy Vince Marcello. The fact that this has that subplot, it does benefit him a little bit because he clearly with the first one, he had a lot of fun directing his actors just dancing on the arcade machine. Now he has a whole subplot where he gets to do that. I'm really starting to think that Vince Marcello has a deep, deep, deep love for Dance Dance Revolution because that's the only thing that explains that subplot. But to your point, that subplot was also very amazing. Do you think that Vince Marcello maybe just got really, really good at Dance Dance Revolution and then the craze died out? So he just kind of has this like deep desire to make Dance Dance Revolution culturally relevant again, so he didn't just learn this skill for no reason. And that's assuming that this wasn't in the source material, which I still have not read, I have to confess. I I, I don't think any of us have read it. Have you, James? I can't say I have, because there's other works of a literary genius I need to work up to before tackling something as sprawling as the book. But I hope to read it one day, and maybe we can do a little bonus episode about, look. I'll just spark note it. Yeah, that works too. And then, Mark, you can just you can just guess what it says in the book, and we'll all give our impressions based off of the version of the book we read. Oh, man, I was going to do spark notes, but okay, fine, I'll, I'll do that. Okay, <laughs> we're off track. Back to the movie. <laughs> this movie goes on so many different directions. I like to think that we're just following along with the movie. 
Yeah, because I mean, whenever you really sit down and think about it, it's a lot for the brain to digest all at once. After you watch it, you kind of have to think, especially the second movie. The first one is kind of just has its one way type of thing. But the second one goes in so many directions. It's crazy. L goes to Boston, the dance dance revolution. They have to get new people for their kissing booth. It's just a lot. And then the whole Lee and his girlfriend, that subplot. It's just a lot, man. Yeah, we also have to talk about this other new character, Chloe Winthrop, who may or may not be with Noah. Oh, man. We completely forgot about Chloe. Oh, I have so much to say about this. <laughs> you go first, James. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, first of all, Maisie Richardson Sellers as Chloe Winthrop is lovely. She has great screen presence. However, our boy Noah is absolutely horrible at trying to, like, squash his girlfriend's fears like could you be more suspicious than how you act around chloe like i was uncomfortable at just the amount of times he failed to be like hey we're just friends nothing funny going on here like it's like he was he was making a bigger problem for himself and honestly chloe wouldn't do anything wrong she wasn't acting suspicious or anything she was just being friendly But because of Noah, she's made to be this kind of villain in the movie. And it doesn't help that one of the earlier scenes, it's when Elle's trying to contact Noah, and it turns out that he doesn't have his phone with him. So who answers the phone for Noah? One of his friends or whatever. The other friend just like, oh, he, he might be with that girl that he keeps talking about. Yeah, like just that scene, along with a bunch of others, it just paints this picture of noah just being this really sus person like he's not so much a creep this time but he's just really bad at relationships let's just put it that way yeah noah is i'm gonna say something here and it's not controversial Mm -hmm. at least i don't think it is so see people like noah who instead of their whole time just doing a bunch of nonsense whenever they interact with women it's either their mother or it's someone that they're either romantically involved with or sexually involved with instead of it being a friendship. And that's where his issues lie. He's never had an actual, and I'm only speaking on this character. It seems like he's never had an actual friendship with a woman. And that's where all of his issues lie is that his advice comes from his mother and his situations instead of an actual friendship. And I feel like, had he had someone like Chloe beforehand, he wouldn't have had to end up in the situation that he ended up in. The way you're describing this kind of like almost makes his arc sound good. It almost sounds like if they had directly built that commentary like into the script, that would have been really interesting actually because I think a big problem with a lot of romantic comedies, at least ones that like primarily feature straight couples, is the fact that they really don't normalize men and women just being friends, with the exception of like Lee and Elle in this movie. And I, I don't know, I feel like they could have commented on that a bit more, because it was it's definitely interesting the more you say about it. Yeah, in fact, Rascal, you mentioned about how his mother could have helped him have a stronger relationship with women. But again, the mother, she's not relevant to any of this. So that's why the movie doesn't have that opportunity to build something like that. Like, I would like to see a version of this movie where Noah's relationship with women, that was like, we were following Noah. In fact, am I really going to say this? I think Noah is a better protagonist for this because he is really flawed. But I think if... If these movies were to go a different way, I actually would think like he'd be really interesting to follow. But because the movie's too focused on L and Lee and all their problems, we don't focus on what actually could be really interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. It almost makes you want a version of the first movie that cuts down on his creepiness and instead plays up the fact that he was a player. Because this movie retroactively like kind of gives him some development. And I can't believe I'm saying that. But like there's n- now, despite him not having an arc in the first movie, he kind of has an arc now. I think I, I accidentally made Noah look good. 
<laughs> Here's where I'm going to get my spiel because the more we, we talk about this, the more I realize and the more I have a confession to make. I really like this movie, unironically, because I like the issues it talks about a lot and it feels very real in a lot of ways, dialogue notwithstanding. I think Joey King, especially, like turns her performance up a couple notches and brings an authenticity that I found like just I don't know I thought the movie itself was kind of sweet and interesting in terms of the fact that it almost says some interesting things about relationships while not quite getting there I think we can all agree that Joey King carries these movies these movies are carried by her and her character L her supporting cast is decent I wish they brought the same intensity that she does i think that courtney who plays lee i think that he brings some of the intensity that joey king brings but for the most part i feel like she has carried this franchise thus far but also the kissing booth too marco matches her energy as well okay can we talk about the marco l romance real quick because i was actually feeling that quite a bit and thought they had a lot in common and was kind of really rooting for them above Elle and Noah. Yeah, I mean, especially with the Dance Dance subplot. Like, I think that whole subplot that definitely does help the characters evolve together. I mentioned earlier that Marco felt... I think Rascal nailed it earlier when he said it was a typical rom-com character. And I think the reason why initially he seemed a little off is that he seemed too perfect as a person and it didn't seem that well-rounded but definitely as the ddr subplot developed those layers kind of opened a little bit and by the time they actually were in the competition i felt like he felt like a real person at that point i think that development that you're speaking of kind of speaks to a strength of the movie which is the fact that it is kind of messy and things get really messy with these characters interpersonal relationships i feel like the whole first like two-thirds of the movie everything is kind of spiraling out of control in a good way and it all comes to a head in this shakespearean dinner table scene can we talk about the dinner table scene boy oh my god it was like seeing every character turn against L and then L destroying two other relationships and then her coming back with one final trump card. It was like, I, I didn't know when the craziness was going to end. Everything was shifting in every moment. And I'm like, damn, Vincent Marcello, you, you might be onto something here. This is like, this, it's, it's not like Shakespeare. It was Shakespeare. I've never seen anybody own a table quite like L did. Never. No words can describe how amazing that one was. Let me backtrack a little bit. Noah talks Elle into applying to colleges in Boston. And he also buys her a plane ticket to fly out to Boston to see him. So Elle flies out to Boston. She meets up with her boyfriend and his friends. Of course, as we have talked about the character of Chloe Winthrop earlier, that is the one person that Elle is anxious to meet. And this is where things kind of get messy. Noah kind of dodges introducing Elle and Chloe. And everybody kind of, if you're sitting down on your couch watching the movie anyways, everybody thinks that's kind of weird. So as things go on and Elle kind of feels distance and she's kind of worried that her boyfriend who's away at college with this beautiful woman is cheating on her. On the day that she's leaving, she finds an earring under Noah's bed and she goes back home and through the rest of the movie, the meat of the movie, she's very, very worried about why the earring was under her boyfriend's bed. Now I know where all of your heads are going because I'm sure that's where me, Marcos and James's heads all went as well. Marcos. I'm so sorry, Mark. Your name's Marcos. No, sorry. <laughs> Shout out to the Melendez family. We're going to have y'all on the pod someday. Oh man, that really kind of threw me off there. It's canon now, y'all. Mark's name is Marcos. <laughs> so at, while they're at the dinner table, of course, this comes up in conversation. But 
if you remember us earlier talking about Elle and Lee's rules about the fact that they have to go to college together, Lee didn't apply to any schools in Boston. So he's at this table and he's upset at his brother and Elle. Elle is upset at her boyfriend and Lee's girlfriend, Rachel, is pissed at Lee and Elle. So it's just a very vicious cycle of anger at this Thanksgiving dinner table. A vicious cycle. I like that. Yeah, again, you're describing this movie in a way that makes it sound really good. It's not bad. And I love how because of that dinner table scene, my girlfriend and I were watching it and we paused it real quick and we looked and saw there was about 40 minutes left in the movie. And that 40 minutes is really just spent kind of sorting through the fallout of that dinner table scene. That's how important it was. That dinner table sequence and the dance dance revolution competition may have been the two most entertaining things about this movie. The dance dance revolution competition scene or DDM, whatever it's called, it was interesting because... Nearly every other performer we saw at that competition objectively should have won over L and Marco. That's kind of an issue I see a lot in competition movies where all the other performers are doing really terrific jobs at what they do, and the our main characters just get it because they do it the longest. It it's kind of something we see in the pitch perfect movies, and it's definitely something we see here. And I'm not gonna act like I don't see that, but Sometimes it's just, like, I think at that point in the movie, I was just willing to go through just the wild routes that this was going to go to. And when they were doing that sequence, I I was enjoying it quite a bit. What I will say is that, um, oh my gosh, I hate whenever this happens. Whenever I'm thinking of a movie and then it just goes over my head. The movie with Will Ferrell. Eurovision Song Contest. Yes. Eurovision. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yes. It's the same thing. Like you were saying about Pitch Perfect, how they only show like a little clip of the competitors, but then we get the whole clip of the actual main characters of the movie. It happens in everything and it drives me crazy. But yeah, it it happened in Eurovision, Pitch Perfect, Kissing Booth 2. I want to say it happens in Step Up in so many other movies. It's crazy. And we can talk about Honey. There's a plethora of movies that we can name, you can probably give that championship trophy or whatever to someone else who had a better routine in the movie, but we didn't get to see the whole routine. But um, I mean, that was probably one of the more entertaining sequences in that film besides the dinner table. You know what? The fact Noah plays on the football team in the first movie and we never see a spring game practice And then he goes to Harvard, and you would think that maybe someone who was so focused on football would possibly be playing football at Harvard, too. We never get a scene or sequence at all. I think that's kind of a mind-boggling thing. How the hell did Noah get into Harvard? Maybe it's because of his football career. The movie never explains it. I mean, he was a little too busy um, taking girls to a secret spot to be studying to get into Harvard. So, I don't know. I think we need a, a longer cut of the first movie to show us that. Release the Marcelo cut. Release the Marcelo cut? Are you are you going to put this into existence? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, um, I, I, I would agree with Rascal that the like two big scenes were really the Dance's Revolution sequence and the dinner table scene. But I think if we're going to talk about one more thing with this movie, we do need to touch on the cliffhanger ending. So as as the movie ends, we see that Elle tells both Lee and Noah that she's been waitlisted for the schools. However, in the final shots, we see that she actually has been accepted to both Berkeley and Harvard. Despite us knowing nothing about her academic prowess or interest, she has somehow gotten into two very, very good schools. Not only that, but as soon as this movie aired on Netflix, they hit us with a surprise reveal. The Kissing Booth 2 is not only getting a sequel, the sequel's already done, has already been filmed, and is presumably in post-production now. So this saga is going to continue. 
What do you think is going to happen in the Kissing Booth 3? Oh, man. It goes to UCLA. Yes. <laughs> the true, true neutral. <laughs> yeah. She probably got accepted to another school other than the two that we see. So let's just imagine she goes there. But um, there might be a third book for this one. I haven't looked into that yet. Um, of course, with adaptations, they can go either way. Certainly, if I were responsible for this decision, what would happen in the next one? I, I guess she, she could go to the school where Noah is. I honestly think in the third movie, she's going to leave Noah for Marco. But that's just me. I don't know about that, though, because the way that Marco was acting the last time we see him, where he was, like, acting in a way like, yeah, I'm going to get her back, it made me think, what if Marco is a villain in the next movie? I guess that it'll all play off of what happens with Marco. Mm -hmm. Is he going to be the new Noah? Is he going to be a creep now? Is that what's happening? Maybe. Maybe it's going to be like Noah has to do battle with Marco because Marco's going to represent the creep he was in the third movie. And by the time the third movie comes around, Noah's going to have fully evolved into being a decent person. It sounds like the only way to conclude this saga. Unless they're going to pull a John Wick and there's going to be way more of these, which I'm, I'm cool with having as many Kissing Booth movies as they want to make. I just want there to be a conclusion I don't want to get left high and dry where we're just wondering what's going to happen. So if they have third one, I think right now, because there's a pandemic and everybody's at home, I'm dropping that ASAP. No, I agree. I know that it's scheduled to hit in 2021 unspecified, but I think they can make this a holiday 2020 blockbuster. Yeah. Before we go to this route, we got to rate the movie, guys. On a scale of 1 to 10, this movie has a rating of 6 IMDb, and the Metacritic score actually is 39. Ouch. Higher than the first one. Let me go look. The Metacritic score. They don't have a Metacritic score for the first one. Wow. They just said, we're, we ain't rating this one. <laughs> Yeah, I was trying to see what um the the tomato meters on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, so for the first one, let me seventeen percent with average rating of three point five out of ten, and for the second one, it's twenty seven percent with average of four point three. So if we're looking at the consensus for the critics, two is better than one. So Mark, what's your rating? This is really funny because I came into this thinking, man, this is just the same kind of movie as the first one, but just longer. There's more stuff going on. So since I gave the four out of ten for the first one, I, I'm going to give a four out of ten for the second one. But since we've been talking about it, it's kind of been rising up. I'll, I'll give it a five out of ten. It, it, for me, overall, it's still pretty mid-level for a teen comedy, although definitely more watchable than the first one. And I think because of how messy it is, it, that's, it kind of works to its strength, even though clearly for a lot of people, that's not to people's tastes. But the fact that it sort of was for mine, that's kind of an achievement. Is not the Irishman, but that doesn't mean that I didn't enjoy every minute. I think The Kissing Booth 2 is a massive improvement on the first movie. And it's a movie I can see myself rewatching, and it made me want to watch the third one. So I'm going to surprise y'all. I think The Kissing Booth 2 is an 8 out of 10. And you're going to commit to that. You know what? I'm going to drop it to a 7, just to be safe. I do not want to be married to that 8. <laughs> okay, because we all know what happened with that Alita rating. <laughs> Alita's going to haunt me for the rest of my life. 7. I'm comfortable with the 7. Ah, James said an eight. Jesus Christ. <laughs> we can we can bleep that out. It didn't happen. Yeah, okay. I'm going to stick with the five. I mean, it, it, you know what? Okay, I'll bump it up to a five and a half. Generous of you, rascal. <laughs> hey, man. Fine. Six. <laughs> See, you were making fun of me, but we're only one rating away. <laughs> you know what? I'll bump this down to a four and shut everything down. <laughs> 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 it, it's very slightly. I, what I can say is it's more meaty, man. I mean, come on now. We have the Dance Dance Revolution tournament. We have the, the epic Thanksgiving dinner table scene. The kiss heard round the stadium. 
or the convention center, should I say. The Kissing Booth 2 just has a lot more going on than the original version. So I can, I can confidently give this movie a six. Cool. Puts us at an average of about a six again. With the first one, it was two sixes and a four. And now it's a five, six, seven. So yeah, flat six. So we just have to make sure that the other one is either a seven or a five, because I can't give these three in a row sixes. Yeah, just watch Kissing Booth 3 be a complete masterpiece. We're all going to give a tens. Depending on what happens in the world by the time it comes out, we might be just so starved for new content that we have to give it tens. This is also true. We're not starved for content in that we um, get more deep films like Extraction and The Old Guard. <clears throat> but um, hopefully we Netflix keeps putting out that Netflix content. So before we go, uh, what have y'all been watching on Netflix? I have currently not been watching anything on Netflix. I have been on a very long Sopranos binge. I don't know what I'm going to get out of it. Honestly, I've kind of stalled out because basketball started back, I will admit. So I'm still in season two, but I am about to dedicate myself to watching at least an episode a day as long as basketball is taking over my entire life. I hate to admit this, but I, I've never seen any of The Sopranos. Hey, man, from one Irishman fan to another, you gotta watch it. Uh, I, I need to confess something. Uh, I also have never seen The Sopranos. <laughs> <laughs> we all have HBO Max. Okay, so yes, we are all yep. gonna watch The Sopranos, and we're gonna make Danny and Jacob very happy. Yes. It's always good to make the two of them happy. For me, this is going to make you happy, rascal. Uh, I finally, finally started watching The Society. I remember, I guess, the first test recording of Talking Netflix, we covered The Society. And I didn't really have much input because I didn't see the show at the time. But now I have, and I really like the show. I, I Everything you said about it, it being this story about teenagers kind of trying to adapt to a world without adults. It, it's just really, really interesting. I like almost every single character. You're right. I, I should just trust your opinions on TV shows. Thank you. I, I do greatly appreciate that, to be honest, man. I, and I cannot wait for us all to sit and talk about the society whenever Netflix decides to stop starving us and give us season two. And the other show that I've been watching not not in its entirety like the society but i've seen bits and pieces of it it's the docuseries down to earth with zach efron um it's a show that exists I, I don't have any strong opinions about it either way it's definitely one of those shows where the topics are infinitely more interesting than the host which that's never a good sign but some of the topics are interesting enough that I kind of enjoyed parts of it because it's basically just Zach Efron and this other and this author just going around the world, just trying to uh, learn about natural resources, water, even other things like religion. It's just basically them just trying to learn about the world. And even though I'm not going to act like Zach Efron himself is this interesting personality filled guy as an educational experience, it's it's not terrible. What a great poster quote. It's a show that exists. So on Netflix, I've primarily been watching two shows, um, one of which we were originally going to cover on our next episode. I've been watching the Netflix series Cursed, which is based on a novel that has drawings from Frank Miller that's basically a reinvention of the King Arthur mythology from the point of view of Nimue, aka the Lady of the Lake. I didn't expect much from the show. However, I'm completely enthralled by it. Catherine Langford plays Nimue, and the show is super stylized, has a bunch of mythology in it, and tons of gore and great characters. I can't recommend it enough. And another show that I've been watching that I think is even better, especially for um, true crime nerds, is the new Netflix Unsolved Mysteries. Not a bad episode in the bunch. Just all great stories that frankly keep you up at night. Y'all should definitely watch those. I can't do the unsolved mysteries, man. I get too creeped out. I'm so serious. You know I love horror and and stuff like that. Like even it, Mindhunters, it got to a point where 
I would kind of just have to stop watching for the rest of the night because I would just kind of get wigged out. Definitely, I hope that everybody takes our recommendations, especially Marcos. Oh my God, I did it again. How dare you? Y'all's names are so much alike, minus the K and the C and the O, that it kind of (laughs) messes with my head sometimes. And there's also another mark on the site. Next thing I know, Rascal's going to call me Jacob. I'm sorry, guys. I'm old. (laughs) You're just like, dude, your names are so similar. It's only like five letters different. (laughs) I can't believe that I did that twice. It's time for me to go to bed. I hope you guys take Mark and James's recommendations because they came from Netflix. Shout out to our sponsor, who's not our sponsor yet. And uh, I really hope you guys take those into consideration. Do you mind if I say one quick thing? Uh, So as y'all may have noticed, um, one of our co-hosts, Katie Gilstrap, is not here this episode. Don't worry. We still love her. She's still very much a part of this podcast, and we hope to get her on as soon as possible. No drama. Katie, come back to us. Get well soon. And also, Full Circle Network, if you like this podcast, there's a lot of other very interesting podcasts in the works that will be unveiled further down the line. Um, I know for a fact that Rascal and I are hoping to discuss Lovecraft's country soon, and beyond that, we're going to let everything else be a mystery. And we will see you guys soon, very soon. Night, everybody, and that's Talking Netflix. We'll see you guys again soon. Thank you.